in High Wycombe. I found myself down in High Wycombe, place of my birth, at 4.45 on a Saturday afternoon. I'll explain in a bit once we got over the road to the right. The beautiful waters of the River Wye, which runs through the bottom of this valley, on its way to make its confluence with the Thames. So that is where we're going to go initially up through that wood, a wood described by the great poet Ivor Gurney and also by the wonderful writer B.S. Johnson. It's quite some wood. To reach Keep Hill, we went across the rye, past the waterfall and up a short track which ended by a chalk pit. At least, we always called it a chalk pit, though perhaps it had not been dug, it was merely a natural escarpment. When I woke up this morning, I thought I would head back out on the London Loop, picking up at Kingston. And the more I sat there, and the more I thought about it, I even printed out the map as well from the TFL website. But the more I thought about it, the more I just, <laughs> I just couldn't face the train journey to Kingston and then getting back from Banstead or somewhere. So it's kind of ironic that I find myself now at five o'clock out in Buckinghamshire. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, I'll probably elaborate on the thought processes in a bit. I, uh, I came across the Rhine when I did the 100th episode a year ago, that was May last year. Today, what's the date today? 15th of June today. But the Rye is a real, it's a real sort of, uh, the Rye is a real place of importance in Wickham. And that you can see here where the river runs through the bones of Willy Rhinoceros and Mouth have been discovered in 1929. A number of bodies thought to be of Celtic origin were discovered close to the dike. They also found earthenware pots going back 3,000 years. Isn't that amazing? All just along this little tranquil stretch of water. This is one of the most sort of fascinating buildings in the town, Pan Mill. There's been a mill on this site going back at least to the Doomsday Book, but most likely before that. I sat around watching Doctor Who with my, with my youngest son. A really amazing Matt Smith series. Fantastic storylines running through that. Anyway, and um, got to half past two and I just thought, you know what? I really can see myself sat up on a hill at sunset. And I thought, do you know what? I think I know where to find just such a hill. So this is a seriously steep climb up through Keep Hill. I remember it from previous walks, but it'll be well worth it. So, buried deep within this hill, there is one of the most strategically important Cold War sites, or was one of the most strategically important Cold War sites. There's a US Air Force Base buried beneath this hill. Of course, there's a surface level element to it, which we'll see, which is the housing site. But the tunnels run deep under the hill. I think it was US Bomber Command for Western Europe, I believe. And there may be people watching this video who will find it because they went to the American High School further up the hill here. Apparently, people used to say you could hear what they called a hill hum, the humming of all the activity beneath the hill here. And this walk I'm doing now, this part of the walk up through Keep Hill Wood, was the first walk I did for the Remapping High Wycombe project, which is a project to do with my sister, 2004-2005, and we got funded by the Arts Council, which was great. And it was a big sort of psychogeographic survey of Wickham as it was going through a major redevelopment. And I did a, a sort of orbital walk, did a series of them, big loops that got smaller and then bigger again. The uh, 100th episode walk I did last year was 
one of those circuits. And this was the first one. And it was uh, really fascinating, actually. And particularly to pick up on the references to B.S. Johnson, who was being uh, sort of revisited and revised in sort of 2004, 2005. He was a very interesting writer from the 60s and 70s, very experimental. And he lived in Wickham as an evacuee and then wrote about it in later years. The other thing that really interested me as I did the research was the way that the, uh, the, this, this section of the, of the valley, the river valley, the Wye Valley, that leads through to the Thames is littered with prehistoric artefacts, there are earthworks, there are archaeological remains that follow the watershed from Ivanhoe Beacon, from the Icknil Way and from the Ridgeway, the ancient, ancient Neolithic trackway that leads right across Britain down to Avebury and Stonehenge and this was almost certainly a kind of branch of that which took people down to the Thames and it was really fascinating to think of kind of prehistoric travellers coming off that main trackway and then working their way through this valley where, where I grew up. So I feel, probably in a slightly biased way, this is a very storied and ancient important landscape. Some of the old maps of Wickham show an ancient British camp in Keep Hill Wood, just adjacent to the path that I'm walking along, although it isn't marked on the most recent and ordnance survey map. So behind that chain link fence there is RAF Dawes Hill, like I say, which was once very important U.S. Air Force Base, Bomber Command, I believe, uh, which in the U.S. Air Force have been using Wickham since the Second World War. I don't think it's active anymore. I think it's now mostly being used as housing. When I walked along this perimeter fence in 2004 with my, with my camera, I was followed along the inside up there by an American uh, security vehicle, security team watching me from behind tinted glass, driving at the pace I was walking until I went back down into the wood. So all the little kind of housing estates in there, the service personnel had names after, uh, were named after US sort of Air Force commanders. I know there's like a Doolittle village there, <laughs> various others. It seems like those names have probably been retained for this uh, private development. You see someone's ripped a hole in the fence. I'm not, that's not really my trip today, to go trespassing on a Royal Air Force Base. We're going to follow this path now, which takes us through, I think, uh, Dean Garden Wood. Head along the top of the ridge now, along the watershed. So we've got these two corrugated tin shelters here, by the side of the field, on the edge of the wood here, above Keep Hill. I'd say they're almost certainly kind of from the Second World War. I've got a horrible feeling this fenced off meadow here could be about to be developed for housing. I might be wrong, it might be something to do with the sewage works. So we're going to walk our way along the edge of this field to that radio mast just up there. And that's a turning point. It's a great view back across the valley. On the, uh, on the walk last year, the 100th episode, we were walking along the bottom of that valley, along the river. Now one of my uh, least favourite things, I'm going to walk along this uh, lane here where it has no footpath. But um, they have cut back a little bit, so it's not too bad. So there you go. It's a big development by Barclay Homes. Abbey Barn Park. Well, they'll have a magnificent view of the valley, that's for sure. So I think this is the uh, M40 that we're going beneath here. The London to Birmingham motorway. When I think of these roads here, up the other side, of the, uh, the Air Force Base, the high ground above Wickham. It reminds me of being a kid and driving out at night time to visit my uncle in Lane End. And 
everyone was sort of obsessed with UFOs then. This is the late 70s. And I'd be driving on those roads, and of course there were lights in the sky, wasn't there? Because you're Booker Airport. And I guess there might have been some sort of military activity around the Air Force Base, probably just lights on, uh, twinkling lights on watchtowers. But <laughs> it used to scare, used to scare me quite a lot, but also really intrigued me and fascinated me. And it was quite exciting, the idea that you might see a UFO. those distant hills there, the other side of this gate, and that's where we're heading now. Just gonna find our way there. Here's the footpath off the lane. Wow, look at this. there and we're gonna go down past hard to find farm which is an intriguing word into Warrenwood and then Bloomwood where you can see that there's an earthwork plunge into this wood ahead just on the other side of Hard to Find Farm. I was speaking to my dad on the walk out of Wickham. He said it was always a very cold wood. Let's wait and see. I wonder if they've ever had any uh, crop circles up here. Not heard of any into the wood. Bloom Wood it was always a place of great mystery to me when I was a kid. We used to come down Sheepridge Lane all the time. My, my dad's good friends with a farmer who has a farm down here. This land is actually owned by Lord Carrington. And we used to come down to the farm here, Pigeon House Farm, all the time. And we used to go to the Crooked Bullet Pub which is almost like the perfect uh, kind of country pub in a lot of ways. And Bloom Wood rises on the hill above. It always looked kind of dark and mysterious. And I remember hearing my dad and, and uh, Noel the farmer talking about um, seeing people, uh, fires at night time up in the wood. And I heard stories of people performing what they would call devil worship up in the woods. So it really had a kind of very strong, mysterious feel. And I don't remember I think we probably only ever went up there maybe once, twice. But it was when I was very, very small. These foxgloves by the path here. I think they are foxgloves, aren't they? Little acorns landscapes is usually the person for plant identification. I'm not entirely sure how to find this earthwork. It's not far from the path. You can see a sort of ditch and bank here. But I don't think this is it. I think it might be a little bit further along. Seems to be doing quite a lot of uh, logging in here, whether that's actually chopping down trees or just logging up fallen trees. So this is roughly where the earthwork should be. Just here. Whether this is it or not, I'm not entirely sure. I believe it was a, a medieval site. I just looked up uh, on the internet like an animal stockade. It is actually just on the other side of the track, just over here. There is a sort of quite high bank here, which is an indicator, but the main indicator is the uh, interpretation board we'll get, which we're going to have a look at. So here's the uh, interpretation board with some basic information. It's not a huge site, 50 metres in diameter, the inner enclosure. You can see it was only recently excavated, 2005-2007, and they concluded that it was probably medieval. Mm -hmm. 
but I'm going to follow this track now straight, straight down, and straight down to um, Sheepridge Lane. Hopefully, come out of the crooked billet. There's a row of cottages there where my nan lived when she was a young woman. It's it's funny actually because I just uh, remembered that we were going to do this walk for um, the radio show I used to do with Nick Papadimitriou, Adventures and Adventures in Topography on Resonance 104.4 FM. Podcasts are available online still. And um, this a variation on this walk is described in one of the old topographical books that I love. I can't remember which one. And it describes this walk, but it carries on instead of I'm branching off down to Sheepridge Lane, it carries on down through the wood to Little Marlow and it crosses the Thames at Marlow and loops all the way back to Bourne End. I think, no, actually, no, it does go down through Woburn Green over Woburn Park and probably up to Burnham to get the train. It's about, I think that loop is about 15 miles or so. Wayfarings Round London by Pathfinder. Field path and woodland rambles in the home counties with directions and maps. Ramble number 30. Autumn fires by the Thames and Y. Given a fine October day with just enough snap in it to make walking a keen delight, there is no part of England I would sooner walk over than this of South Buckinghamshire. It is well known to riverside men, anglers, oarsmen and the like, but one meets few pedestrians. And yet, it has every merit that a good countryside for the wayfarer should have. Hanging woods, smooth chalky uplands, green water meadows, the finest, prettiest stretch of the Thames, old towns and hospitable inns, and a network of seldom used footpaths. I nearly lost my uh, sense of direction then. Luckily that's why I use the app with the map, not just uh, one or the other. And this is the path that takes me down to Sheepridge Lane. It's funny, isn't it? I nearly didn't go out for a walk today, and yet I've ended up exactly where I want to be, precisely where I want to be at this time of the day. just as I was coming out of that wood my dad called me I was just wondering whether I should call him and he told him exactly where I was he said I used to stand under that wood and shoot pigeons as they were coming in on the cabbages so now this field has been given over to grazing and my nan is said to have lived in a cottage around here somewhere when she was a young girl that would have been before the first world war and the old man has insisted that I go in the crooked billet and have a pint sat in this garden. Who am I to disobey my father? Carrying out my father's orders, sitting in the garden looking up at the field opposite. There's obviously some roadkill. Let's look, a big host of red kites, they're enormous birds. down on something on this road. Lovely little footpath here that runs along the side of Sheepridge Lane. We'll go somewhere a bit special next. Some time ago, and not exactly when, but it's hmm, over 30 years ago, my uh, dad planted out an orchard in a field just down here near Pigeon House Farm and apparently I think he, he populated the orchard with local varieties of fruit trees. Flackwell Heath was quite well known for its cherry trees back in the past so I think there are very local particular varieties of cherry that were once found in the Chilterns. I think there are apples and pears as well and I believe the orchard is still there and still Thriving, I believe, so it's got a fine pigeon house farm. What a beautiful field. These are the fields of some of my earliest childhood memories up here. Some mushrooms here by the footpath. 
So here's the orchard on the other side of this hedge. It's a shame, I'm not sure I'm gonna get a view of it. One of my earliest childhood memories, if not the earliest, is of walking across these fields with my dad. In fact, that field up there. And it was sunset and I'd, he'd just shot a pigeon and I'd run to get the pigeon, picked it up. We were walking back, winter sunset, and my legs were so tired. And I wanted them to pick me up he said, no, you'll have to walk, boy. And then next thing I knew, he hoisted me up onto his shoulders and carried me back down over these fields with me holding the pigeon out <laughs> with blood dripping out of his beak. It was a really beautiful childhood memory. And I think the spirit of that is often with me, actually. I think that's why I seek out landscapes like this at sunset particularly in middle age. And uh, it's kind of fueled me ever since. Yeah, it was this field here, on the brow of that hill. So this is more or less the location of that wonderful childhood memory, very potent childhood memory. We come over the corner of this wood here and we were heading back down to Pigeon House Farm where the old man had parked the car. And I don't know why that particular memory is so strong, so resonant in my memory. You might think maybe it was to do with the fact that I was holding that, that pigeon, that dead pigeon with the blood dripping from its beak. But to be honest with you, I was always picking up dead pigeons, dead pheasants, dead rabbits and things. And uh, it never bothered me once. <laughs> it was just such a part of the environment, you know, part of the world that I was in. My nan used to come over and, and skin the dead rabbits in the kitchen sink when you were having your breakfast at the breakfast table. She'd be like about a metre away, <laughs> skinning and gutting a rabbit. <laughs> yeah, didn't enjoy that so much. But wow. What a view from up here. That's incredible, isn't it? We're looking down there towards Marlow and towards the Thames. So it's uh, 8.30 now, and I uh, just had a nice chat with the old man on the phone and shared that, uh, shared the fact that I was here and that childhood memory, and he actually sort of remembered it. It refers to this, uh, this wood up here as a spinny, spinny up there. I was telling me this funny story about one of the local farmers uh, enlisting another one of the farmers to help bury his favourite cow in that wood. <laughs> anyway, so we've got about 45 minutes till sunset and it gets dark. We're going to just come out up here in Flackwell Heath, which at one point used to claim to be the largest village in England. I think it's one of those things where a few other places claim that as well. Luckily for me, the chippy over there, Frackle Friars, they're playing on Flackwell Heath, the local uh, pronunciation, we'll call it Frackle. It's just closing, which is saving me from destroying my health with a bag of chips. This is the centre of Flackwell Heath, the heart of Chilton's life, England's biggest village. This is the main drag. This seems huge to us who live down in Wooban Green.
Well, this feels like a, a natural end to the video, even if it's not an end to the walk. It's a really magical walk. I hope you enjoy coming with me. I hope it wasn't too much of a nostalgia fest. That's another reason why I'm going to end it now, because I'm about to go down through Wuben Green, what the village where I grew up, as you know. I've mentioned it many times. But this is a wonderful conclusion to this spontaneous, impulsive journey out into the Chilterns. I wonder where we're going to be next week. Who knows? We could end up anywhere. <laughs>